few words, a few words about myself. I'm uh, Riccardo Biasini, and I'm Chief System Architect at Comma.ai. Uh, jo I joined Comma in 2016, and prior to work at Comma, I worked for about uh, five years at Tesla. I was uh, uh, working on electric uh, powertrain technology, and then uh, in uh, autopilot. And before that, I did some research at the State University uh, for about one year on electric vehicles. Um, I think a good way to start talking about self-driving cars in, is to uh, introduce them by uh, the levels, um, like uh, the society, uh, the SAE divides uh, um, self-driving cars into uh, five different levels. Um, so the first level is level one. Uh, what is level one? Well, it's uh, what we can buy today. Pretty much every new car that we buy is considered level one. Uh, the human is fully in control of the car and the car provides some driver assistant features. So for example, uh, it can provide adaptive cruise control, so something that maintains the distance with the car in front, uh, automatic emergency braking, and lane keep assist that allows you to uh, go back in the lane if, you are, if, if the car detects that, for example, you are distracted and you are departing the lane. But the point is you are fully in control of the car and you're constantly interacting with the car. The next level is called level two. Um, probably the most uh, notable example of uh, level two system is the Tesla Autopilot. And here the, the behavior of the car is completely different. The car is uh, now fully in control of driving and the driver, when the system is activated, a system watches that the car is actually doing the right thing. So it's different. We go from car driving to the, from, from the driver being fully in control to the car being in control and the driver assisting the car. The next step is, is level three. Uh, I demarked uh, the transition to level three uh, with, with like a vertical line because uh, here the parting change, like the main difference is that the liability goes from being uh, from the driver, from level one and level two, no matter what happens, the driver is, is, is responsible for driving. From level three and above, the car is actually, uh, uh, takes the responsibility whenever the cell driving features are active. So what level three allows the driver to do is allows the driver to be distracted, does not require the driver to be ready to take over immediately, and it works in limited environment, and it always guarantees a few seconds of safety operation, even when the system detects like a situation that cannot handle. So imagine that you're driving, you are like reading a book or reading your email, the car detects something that cannot handle, then it's gonna beep at you and it's gonna still perform safe operation for maybe five to eight seconds. That's what is considered like a good transition time. And then you have to take control. The next step is level four. Uh, I think that a good, a good example like of level four cars is what we see in, in from uh, deployed from Waymo or like there are many other companies, um, Zoox, uh, or uh, Cruise, GM. They're all working on level four. So what level four is, well, it's taking the driver out of the loop. Like, let's take the driver completely out of the car and let's have like a driverless vehicle working in limited environment. The, the next example, the, the, the next level is called level five. Um, level five is the evolution of level four. It's like level four, but instead of working in limited environment, it's supposed to work everywhere uh, at any time without uh, a human. So it needs to work at least as good as human everywhere. Uh, I personally believe that it makes sense, uh, like the two levels that are interesting where people are working on are either level two or level four. And those are the ones that we should pay close, uh, close attention uh, in the evolution of their technology. Um, so wh why do I say that uh, like level two and level four are, are the most important one? Well, let's look at the numbers. Uh, let's look at how many cars, like what are the distribution of the levels on the cars today on the market in the United States? 87.2% of cars deployed like that, that we see on the road today are level zero. So they have no assistance. If you look around pretty much like uh, one, um, one in uh, seven, like six out of seven cars that you see, I have no assistance at all. Uh, then there is about like 12% of cars that have level one. So they have limited assistance, pretty much all the new cars uh, go into this category. And then there is about like a 0.2% of cars that are considered level two. Um, I would say those 0.2% is like in large portion made by Tesla autopilots and like in uh, less uh, 
um, less extend from like Cruise GM and few other examples that are popping up from, uh, from automakers. Um, so what, why uh, do I say that, for example, like level three is not so interesting and I don't see level three being the next evolution, like the next step uh, towards uh, like a driverless future? Well, because uh, level three by definition uh, needs to guarantee a few seconds of automated driving when it encounters a situation that it cannot handle. Um, doing that is not easy at all. Uh, imagine that the system, like it's driving at highway uh, at 70 miles per, miles per hour, like maybe 70, 75, and it encounters a situation that does not how to handle. Well, doing safe operation for five seconds means that you travel pretty much like a, more than a football field uh, during, during the time. And so, yeah, keep the, the, the car doing something safe, it's pretty much as hard as solving for level four, even if you only have to guarantee those, those few seconds uh, when the car encounters a situation that it cannot handle. Uh, well, you can say, well, yeah, but it's true what you're saying, but there is one car that actually shipped on the market uh, that has level three, and it's true. Uh, it's called the A8. It's the Audi A8. Um, it, it did not ship in the US for regulatory reasons, but let's look at the limitation of such system. So you need to be on a multi-lane road. Uh, you need to be, you have to have barrier between lanes, so pretty much like on a high-speed uh, highway. Uh, you need to have structure along the edge to make sure that there are no pedestrians. Your speed needs to be lower than 37 miles per hour, and the speed of the surrounding vehicles is also low. Um, so th th this is almost impossible situation to meet, and it's not what level three is supposed to be. It's just like an extension of level two. If something goes wrong in this situation, nothing bad can really happen, and so yes, the car can take like liability for, for the situation. Uh, it does not scale to situation re uh, requiring faster reaction time. If you're driving an highway at high speed, uh, you, you, you need to be able to handle the situation uh, and probably you need like level four technology. So what, what about level four? Level four is interesting. It's an interesting technical challenge. There are a lot of companies working on it, but what, what is level four? What does level four try to solve? Well, let's think about it. What is the definition of like level four? So we, we, like we have level four cars, how do they work? Well, the idea is that they allow you to go from point A to point B without requiring you to drive. And if you think about it, this already exists. Like there are taxi, there are Uber, I can, I can use public transportation. So they're trying to replace a service that already exists. It's not gonna be more practical. It's not gonna be more practical than Uber. It's not gonna be more practical in certain cases than public transportation. If you live in Manhattan and you wanna go from point A to point B, probably taking the metro is the best way to do it. So what's the advantage of level four? Well, the advantage is the idea that they're gonna cost less. Why? Because uh, the idea is to remove the driver and to remove the cost of the driver, which I personally have some, some doubt. Like w when you pay a Uber drive, uh, a Uber drive it's not a big portion of, of your fare that goes to uh, the driver. Uh, the big majority pays uh, for the car maintenance, car insurance, gas, and the fees uh, to, 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 to Uber. Um, so level four, by definition, since it's not supposed to drive anywhere, anytime, does not compete with car ownership. It's not meant to end the car ownership. This idea that when level four succeeds, the people will stop owning cars is just not what level four is going to give us. And it's also like very unclear how long such a service will take to be better of Uber, Lyft, public transportation in terms of cost and practicality. So what about level five? Like I said, I w when I showed the, the slide before about the levels, I didn't show any example of uh, companies working on level five because literally nobody is working right now on level five. It's a very hard problem. Those are two famous quotes uh, that I usually put in my presentation. One is from Elon. Uh, in 2016, he said that in about two years, uh, someone, which is the function that is supposed to uh, call your car uh, out of your garage that is working, you press a button and the car like uh, slowly crawl out of your garage. Well, he was predicting that in 2016 and in about two years, so 2018, the car was able to have this function working from New York to LA, for example. So he was imagining a future in 2018 where a car could drive completely uh, without human intervention, without a driver in the seat uh, from New York to LA. And another quote is from uh, Chris Armstrong, back in, uh, he was like the uh, ex uh, chief of the self-driving problem at Google before he became Waymo. 
and he was expecting that his son, which was 12, was not going to need a driver license by the time that he was going to be uh, uh, 16. Uh, that was in 2015. His son was 12. Now I'm pretty sure he's more than, uh, than 16 years old, and uh, I'm pretty sure he got his driver license. Why, why it's actually like hard uh, to, to solve for, for level five and nobody's working on it? Well, it's a very, it's a very challenging problem. Um, you have to solve for situations that are very hard to train a system for, and humans are very good at it because uh, they actually use uh, uh, like things that they have learned outside uh, driving. Uh, the first time that I drove a car myself, uh, I did okay. How come if I never drove a car? Well, I did okay because uh, uh, I, was, I, was actually, uh, I was actually transferring the learning that I did outside driving to, uh, to, to driving itself. So how much of, uh, of driving is actually using skills that have nothing to do with driving? It's possible that to be able to replace the driver entirely in any situation, you might need some sort of like artificial general intelligence systems being developed first. And so this is, this is something that is, is definitely going to take a while and I don't see it being like in a, in a close horizon. Um, so why level two then? Well, so what's interesting about level two is uh, people spend 5% of the t awake time driving and while you drive, you pretty much take w one action of correcting the gas, correcting the brake or correcting the steer pretty much every second. So if you drive for about like three hours, uh, like three hours straight, uh, that's about uh, 10,000 single intervention that you have to make to your car. Uh, and th that's relatively stressful. Another thing that is worth noticing is that uh, there have been last year 37 fatal accidents in the US. Uh, that's an increase of 15% from the minimum reach in 2014. This is, this is like quite interesting because, uh, and unfortunate because uh, for many decades, uh, fatal accidents in the US have been going down. Uh, the reason why it has been going up since 2014 is that people are more distracted while driving. They, they mo look more at their phone. And uh, unfortunately, this is, this is made uh, more fatal accidents. And so there is really the need of uh, making sure that there's a system monitoring the driver paying attention. Um, I'm not sure why I just see that. So Another very important thing to note is, and this is great, uh, is that all level one cars sold today, so pretty much every new car sold today, already have the hardware to be a level two system, to, 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 to have level two system. Like if you think about level one cars, since they are capable of maintaining distance with the car in front of you, are able to steer you back in the lane if you are about to depart the lane, it means that they have ways of controlling the gas, the brake, and the steer. And so, those, those actuators can actually be controlled in a better way, not only to provide level one features, but actually level two features. Uh, the reason why cars that we see on the market today have only level one features and not level two, in my opinion, is because of uh, uh, cars are developed with a very long development process. It's not possible to make over the air update in pretty much like every car on the market today, except for Tesla. And uh, the car, uh, the car, like the hardware that makes your chassis, like the, your actuators, is very integrated with uh, the hardware that makes uh, your computing and the software that comes with the car. And if you think about the lifespan of a car, the average lifespan of a car is 15 years. Um, think about how much like computing and computers have changed in 15 years. So I do believe there is this need to decouple the, the hardware of the cars, uh, like what, what's the chassis and what's uh, your actuators and what's like what makes the hardware for your car from your computing hardware, which is what actually uh, makes your, uh, your, your, your uh, driver assistance features. So in, in order to describe what Avenue is, we can just look at the video. This is, uh, this is uh, our system that we developed at Comet AI. It's, uh, you, you can see the system itself, like the hardware is uh, uh, mounted on the windshield. It connects with the uh, CAN, which is the uh, communication system of, of the car. And this is retrofitting a level one car, which is a 2016 on the Civic. So how does a level two system works? Well, so the idea is that you press a button, you engage, and then the car handles driving for you. You have to pay attention, but the car will keep you in the lane, will slow down, will accelerate, depending on traffic conditions and all other information that they can gather from the environment. Um, so 
it's, uh, it's a very different way of driving. Uh, of course, uh, as the system gets better, it's very important that the driver keeps paying attention. And so every level two system, as the level two system gets better, it's very important to monitor the driver. And so in our system, this is done by a camera that is also watching the driver. So there are two cameras, one looking at the road and one watching the driver. So how does driver monitoring work? Um, so the idea is that uh, the, the camera is watching you and so if uh, you, for example, while driving, you're being distracted, so you're looking away from the road, or for example, you're falling asleep, or anything the system detects that you are not looking straight, then the system is gonna start to alert you, it's gonna start to beep at you, and then eventually if you don't take control, the system goes into a mode where it's gonna force you to disengage the automated feature, and it's gonna slowly bring down the car to a safe stop. So, how, how does like self-driving car work? So, like before introducing and talking about uh, data, let, let's spend a, a few, few words about uh, how an architecture of self-driving car is. Well, this, you might have seen this before. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very standard uh, um, kind of like layout of the system working uh, in a, uh, a self-driving car, but more in general in, in many robotics uh, um, um, systems. So you have uh, an initial, like your input comes from your sensors. You, have, you use sensors to, uh, to sense the world. Um, in self-driving cars, those sensors are typically cameras, lidars, radar, uh, ultrasonic sensors, and all the sensors that you use to perceive uh, the, the, the state of the car itself, like accelerometers, uh, um, uh, gyroscope, uh, and uh, like magnetometer, GPS to understand your positions. And so once you have the data from, uh, from this sensor, what do you use them for? Well, two things. One is you localize yourself. Uh, you localize yourself in, uh, in the world reference. This is very important because, uh, well, if you, if you are uh, working towards like a system where the car like drives itself, it needs to be aware of your position uh, to better uh, drive you uh, wh wh while the system is active. And it also uses the, the input from the sensor to make a semantic representation of the environment. You go from a dense sensor output, for example, for cameras, you have these uh, uh, like million of pixels in RGB format, so it's very dense, it's very, it's very high dimensional output, to something that uh, you compress and you extract information that then you need, that people know how to interpret, and then you need to keep going with your flow of, uh, of operation. So in, to make some example in self-driving cars, so usually the, the, the perception layer determines where lane lines are, where cars are, and where all the various obstacles on the road are. Um, so then you use this input uh, uh, to your next block, which is called planning. So once I know where like obstacles are, so I understand my environment in a semantic way, then I can plan for it. I can generate a trajectory that I want the car to take. Once, uh, once I have uh, the trajectory, uh, I actually have one last block, which is called controls. And it's the block that actuates the car, physically actuates the car, to make sure that the car follows your plan. Um, good news uh, about this current state of self-driving cars on sensor and localization. This is already at superhuman level. Uh, like you can put as many cameras and as many sensors you want around the car. You can have at any given instant a perfect 360 view of, of your surrounding. Human, of course, have to turn their head and they have to sacrifice some field of view while they are looking around. Uh, in in self-driving cars, this is not necessary. You can put as many sensors as you want. Um, and localization is also super human. Uh, I mean, like, uh, for example, like last year, we, we drove around a closed track uh, without using uh, any, any vision input, just by using our GPS uh, and doing like a sensor fusion with, with the sensor on the car, like accelerometer and uh, gyroscope. Uh, and we were able to continuously loop around the track without having any sensor. And we had like, I would say, probably a precision of uh, less than one meter, like uh, less than three feet in placing, in understanding where the car is in world reference. This is already superhuman, like human, of course, don't understand where they are in world reference uh, with such accuracy. Um, controls uh, are good enough. Uh, they're definitely uh, better than human when they work in their 
specific domain of operation where they have been uh, developed for. Uh, they don't work or like they're a little bit trickier to have them work as good as human when the condition uh, suddenly change. So imagine that you're driving and all of a sudden you hit a bump or uh, your steering uh, gets misaligned. Well, then you have to have a algorithm to understand that uh, for you driving straight means uh, applying a little steering on the side. Well, so this is, uh, you have a lot of those situations that you need to handle and handling all these situations is a bit trickier and I think human can do this uh, uh, currently better than machines, uh, so adapting to sudden change of your model. Um, but I, I, I think controls like are definitely like pros and cons with respect to human, and they are good enough. It's now what's holding back uh, self-driving cars. The thing that are like highly subhuman, human do better than machines, is sensor fusion and perception and planning. Sensor fusion and perception, like understanding the semantic representation of the world, human are better at it. Typical examples, there is a long tail of events where self-driving cars have a little bit hard time handling them. Uh, so imagine like you see a plastic bag tumbling on, on the road. Well, self-driving car might recognize that there is like an obstacle, but then you have to decide, is this something that I can eat or is this something that I should break for? And this decision becomes very important if you're driving at 65, 70 miles per hour down the highway. Um, planning is also, is also very hard. Uh, the way that human think, like plan their trajectory, uh, I personally believe, as I was saying before, it has more to do with uh, skills that not necessarily people have learned from, from driving, but things that they just understand. They have some sort of like intuition about the physics of the world uh, that they just apply and they, and they generate those trajectory. And it's very hard uh, creating algorithms that generate uh, uh, trajectories. Um, so uh, maybe a better approach, which is what we are pursuing at Kama, is uh, putting together and try to solve at once uh, uh, sensor fusion and perception and planning, or, or, or some sort of like more like an end-to-end -end approach. And I f we think this is gonna scale better than trying to separate these two blocks. So what are data useful for? Well, data useful for uh, improving uh, those, uh, th th those, th those two blocks because they do need machine learning and machine learning uh, can work with, uh, with data. So let, let's talk about data. Why are data important in, uh, in uh, self-driving cars? Uh, well, of course, first, first thing is to train neural networks. Uh, you, have, you collect your data, you collect your data from your devices, from your fleet, and then based on the behavior, the correct behavior that the car took, uh, uh, on the road, you try to train neural network that understand uh, uh, how, how to drive as they got from the example of, of driving. Uh, another thing why data is important is that you can use data to build your own HD maps. Uh, this is an example of, uh, our, uh, uh, of the maps that we started to build based on our data. Uh, you can, in this case, we generated a cloud point uh, uh, data set that, for example, described the Bay Bridge in, in the Bay Area. And this is important because uh, having these information uh, helps you localizing very precisely in world reference when, when you're driving. Data is also useful to simulate and debug. Uh, when you collect back data from, from your fleet, uh, uh, you, can, you can use this data uh, to, to see what happened. Uh, and uh, you can re-simulate the data, you can, you can use, uh, I mean, this is our, one of our uh, debugging tool, and you can actually replay part of your code on uh, uh, the data that, that, that you collected to see how, for example, some changes of your code will affect uh, part of uh, uh, the data, part of the output that was, that was actually collected. Uh, and then, of course, you want to collect data in case of self-driving cars, eventually to offer a service to your users. Uh, the product that we sell is called the Coma Ion. It's the device that I, will show, that I showed before in the video, and it also works as a smart dash cam. So you, you have cameras, you can collect data through the cameras, and then of course like the user uh, can have uh, access to their own data. Uh, and we built our own like Explorer, so if you are like a comma Ion user, then you can go on uh, explorer.com.ai and review uh, your drive and everything that happened. Uh, so one thing that's important to talk about is also the costs about data collection because we talk about the benefits and ma someone might have the idea or like the, the, the impression that more data is better. Well, you have to consider also that there are costs associated to data and it's not always true that more data is better. I think a good, a good plot is the one on the right which separates between companies that uh, 
have a, like, a product in the field uh, and they can collect their data through the product that they sold versus companies uh, that actually have to make their own fleet and they have to pay in order to collect data. Um, I mean, if you, if you think about how much a Tesla costs, how much like individual profit maybe Tesla can make on each car and you work out the math, I believe that uh, Tesla uh, makes money for each mile that they collect because it means that they sell more cars. And I would say like same way is true for us. The more miles we collect, it means the more uh, devices we have sold. This is definitely not true for companies that are working on level four. They have to make uh, uh, their own uh, cars, they have to make their own devices, and they have to pay drivers, uh, at least one, in some cases even two, that at any given time drives car around, and you, you have to pay basically for their salary. And so if you think about the math, how much you pay each driver, well, it costs uh, to level four companies about, I, 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 I like estimate, these are my estimates. I estimate that they pay about $2.5, uh, about $2.5 per miles. If you think that uh, companies like Waymo connect pretty much the same amount of uh, miles that uh, we collect, I believe it's around uh, uh, several tens, tens of thousands of miles each day. Well, if they pay $2.5 uh, multiplied by, let's say, 30,000 miles, uh, that's about $70,000 per day. Uh, that throughout a year, that's like about like $21 million. And uh, yeah, it's. It, the budget, you, you have to have deep pocket if, if, you, if you are owning like a level four fleet and you are collecting data through your own fleet. Another thing that you have to consider is like connectivity in cost. You have these devices that collect your data. How do you get data back? Well, if you own your fleet, uh, this might be a little easier because the car gets back and uh, you, you basically um, can, can stream back uh, uh, the data using like physical connection. But for our distributed devices, yeah, we can use Wi-Fi, but it's very convenient for users if can actually upload their data through cellular connection. So our connection has a cost, and so these must be considered when you, uh, when, when you, when you stream back uh, data to, uh, to, your database, to your data center. Another thing that has cost, uh, if you use data for, um, the, the, for uh, training in uh, machine learning, you have to label them. And the label is something that uh, is generally done by humans. So you have to teach what's right to your neural network. And so you do this uh, by having like, uh, it's usually done by having like humans, like taking a picture and telling, uh, and like n taking notes in where in the picture things are what everything in the picture is. In this case, where cars are, where road are, lane lines, uh, buildings, uh, etc. cetera. Um, we at Comma move completely away from uh, human labeling and we try to do everything automated. So we use neural networks to label uh, data that we use to train other neural networks. Um, another thing that it's, uh, it's uh, like that you pay for uh, is of course processing, training, and data transfer. If, if you have your data stored on the cloud, on your like local data center, you do spend on the data on like processing your data. Uh, you do spend electricity to train your data uh, because uh, they run on GPUs and uh, you do spend also data for data transfer. If you, if you have your data on the cloud, you have to transfer your data to something local eventually if you want to train locally, and this, this also has a cost. And, and probably the most important thing is the cost of uh, storage the data. Um, one thing that at Camera we quickly realized is uh, as the number of users that we have keeps growing, we saw that a really like steep increase in storage cost. If you think about it, uh, and if you assume that, that the number of users that you have uh, is some sort of like growing linearly um, over, over time, uh, well, think about uh, how much storing their data indefinitely is gonna cost you. Um, I mean, generally, if, if your function of user increase is called f of x, where x is your time, well, the, con the cost of storing their data is the integral of uh, of f of x because you have to store all their data, old data and new data over time. And so no matter what your business model is, uh, uh, in the case of self-driving cars where data are particularly expensive because in our case, every hour of driving is between five and 10 gigabytes. Uh, 
uh, in the case of uh, level four cars, uh, I would not be surprised if every hour of data is gonna be hundreds of gigabytes. Well, you're gonna quickly uh, start to skyrocket your, uh, your uh, cost of storage if you don't act on it and you don't you start like, to delete all data as your user base actually grows. So some, some tips uh, about uh, uh, data, uh, data storage and use of data. I think unless you have, as I said before, like uh, a, lot of, a lot of money, uh, people have invested a lot of money on you and you can build your own fleet and you can, you can afford of paying tens of billions of dollars per year in data collection. Think about uh, uh, making a sustainable business model around collecting data early on in your, in, in your stage. So in, in case of Comma, the first product that we actually released was a dash cam app. You could download from the App Store or from, uh, from, from the Google Store, uh, Google Play, you could download our app, which was called Schiffer, and it's, it's a dash cam app. And uh, through that app, we were collecting data. The, the app was free, but at least we didn't have to pay for, for every data that, that we collected. Uh, the second product that we released uh, is, uh, was uh, CanReader. Uh, it's, it's an OBD2 dangle, it's called Panda, and this is the first time that we started to make a profit with, with, with a product. So by syncing your app with the CanReader, not only we had uh, back vision, like camera data from, uh, from, from, from the car, from, from your phone, but also we were able to sync the data with your Can uh, the, the, with all the data that was running onto your uh, uh, communication area network, which is the protocol of communication of your car. And this is, was great because we could like sync what the ca everything that was being recorded from the sensor of the car together with the video data coming from your phone. And then we evolved into the product that we are currently selling, which is called the Comma Ion. It's a smart dash cam. It's something that you can install on the windshield of your car. By default, it provides passive driver assistance features, and with passive, I mean uh, uh, warnings. So it detects if you are distracted, it warns you if you are about to collide, and then, of course, it provides all the functionality of a dash cam. Um, but at the same time, it's also an, a completely open development platform, which can be coupled with uh, our open source software, which is called Open Pilot. And so it does support Open Pilot. And Open Pilot is the software that I showed you before in the video that can actually like, drive your car. Another thing that you, you might want to, to consider uh, about, about data is uh, think if the cloud service is, is worth it. Like, is it worth? Uh, storing, storing your data on, uh, on the cloud is definitely a good starting point. This is where like, we started as Kama. Um, we, we started to um, upload all our data on the cloud. Also, uh, cloud services, like companies that provide cloud services are very good in giving you some sort of like a intro uh, grant where basically you basically use their service for free up to a certain amount of expenses. And this is a great starting point, but then as your user grows, if you really don't have like a backup plan or a way to contain your cost, you'll find yourself once you run out of the free money provided by the cloud service that you are going to spend uh, after that a, a very high monthly cost because as I said, your user grow is growing quickly. And so consider that keeping your data on the cloud is actually a good thing, especially if you use your data for training and you want to set up like a, a easy infrastructure to transfer data around, maybe actually transfer it locally is a, is, is a good solution. And we definitely thought it was a good solution for us. We did the math, uh, buying our hard drives um, allows us to repay uh, the, 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 the cost of the cloud in about two months. Of course, we don't have the same redundancy that we have on the cloud, but at the same time, as I said before, our users keeps going, and so for us, there is no much value in today's data. There is more value in the ability of collecting new data. Uh, select and upload only the data that you need. Currently at Kama, we are uploading all the data from users, but we'll soon start to think about, uh, well, maybe not all the data are so relevant. Uh, most of the data about driving is uh, somewhat boring. Uh, it's about driving straight on the highway, and after you have uh, enough data of this, maybe you don't need any more data, and instead you can select your own data based on certain criteria that you define at any given time. 
Uh, it could be, for example, any time that the user intervene, any time that the user corrected the action of your system. Uh, it's very interesting data because it means that somewhat your system failed to do something right. And so that's useful data or maybe like turns or maybe adverse uh, climate conditions, etc. And ultimately, this is uh, for some psychological reasons they companies tend to keep around the data that they don't use. My recommendation is discard data that you don't use. Uh, as you progress in your hardware, uh, you'll have legacy data. Legacy data means data that you are not using. It's incompatible with newer data. And so instead of keeping it around and thinking maybe I will find a use of them in the future, think about that you are paying constantly a monthly fee for them and maybe like a better idea is, uh, is discard data that you don't use. Don't keep that around if you don't have a good use for them at any given time. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Definitely, I think uh, level, level five cars, I don't think there is a need to call them level six, I think level five cars uh, will actually be very similar to what, what you described when they're gonna be deployed. I think a lot of it will be around like entertaining. It's pretty much like uh, flying, uh, like uh, the idea of uh, giving entertainment uh, to the driver. Um, I mean, we start to see maybe, I mean, we see a little bit of these like in cabs, uh, where you, when you take a taxi, you have, you have in some taxi, you have like, uh, I, 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 like you can watch a video in front of you. Uh, and I definitely see these way more like passenger center, like those like level five vehicles being deployed in this way. Um, I don't know, like, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. I think the first deployment of level four is probably gonna be retrofitting existing cars. Building new cars is very hard. Uh, getting like the good reliability is hard. And it's a lot easier to retrofit uh, existing, existing models uh, with, uh, with the hardware and the, and, uh, the sensor that, that you need. But then uh, as like the technology progress, then I do believe that cars are gonna be optimized around uh, the customer experience, definitely. Uh, I we're think out we're out of time, okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are you gonna be around for a bit? Definitely, yes. Okay. Hi everybody, um, welcome to the fireside chat. Um, so today, over the last few days, we've been listening to experts talk about machine learning, AI, um, and applications to different industries um, and I hope you've enjoyed the sessions for the last few days. Now we're going to kind of deep dive into autonomous vehicles, um, the hype and the impact of the industry and so I'm going to let, would you like to introduce yourself again? Yeah definitely. Awesome. Um, so my name is Riccardo Biasini and uh, I'm with Comma.ai. Uh, I joined Comma in 2016 and I'm chief systems architect and prior to Comma uh, I worked at Tesla on the autopilot system and uh, on the development of uh, electric powertrains. And before that, I worked on uh, research in electric vehicles uh, at the Ohio State University. So autonomous vehicles and, um, and um, automated vehicles. Let's talk about, let's start out with definitions, just level set. And I'm sure some of y'all were at the session this morning, but for the newcomers, what's... Yeah, I, I think a good way, as, as I mentioned before in the presentation for, 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 for the people that weren't here for the presentation, it's important to distinguish between uh, uh, levels of automation. Uh, the SAE uh, defines the five different levels, uh, level one, two, three, four, and five. And level one is uh, pretty much like uh, the car uh, some assists the driver, so the driver drives all the time, but the car it make, makes intervention and makes driving safer and easier. Um, in level two, the, ca the, the, the car is fully in control of driving and the driver actually assists the car. An, an example is uh, Tesla, Tesla's vehicle, GM Super Cruise, and what we develop at Comet AI. Um, and then from level three and above, uh, 
the driver is not responsible anymore. The car is responsible uh, for, for the driving action. So the driver is not required to pay attention at all time. With level three, uh, the driver is only required to take control of the car after a few seconds of safe operation of the vehicle when the vehicle encounters a situation that cannot handle. And then for level four and five, uh, his driver is completely driverless vehicle. Uh, and in level four is limited environment. In level five is uh, full, uh, full automation in uh, unlimited environment. So basically making a robot that can drive as good as a human. So autonomous vehicles have been pretty high in the news. So yeah. is, you know, next week, is this gonna, when, when are they coming into the market? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And the answer is uh, certain, certain levels of automation are already here. Uh, level, uh, le level one is uh, what you buy today. If you buy a new car, any new one, the new Toyota, like the most popular cars have level one automation. Uh, few cars on the market and represent about 0.2% of the fleet today in US are level two, um, mainly are uh, Tesla autopilots. And uh, then there is no like uh, released uh, car in US that is like level three or above. And so when, when are those car comings? When I would say first, we should, we should try to increase the number of cars that are level two. How do we make the existing cars like smarter? How do we, how do we make the fleet? How do we change the fleet uh, uh, incrementally? And I would say the natural uh, like way that it's gonna change is cars are gonna transition from uh, level one to level two. And then when level four, level three, four and five are gonna be deployed, well, I would say, like I would say before in the presentation, I think, one interesting level uh, that we should be paying attention to is level four. Level three does not make much sense because solving for level three is pretty much as hard as solving for level four, guaranteeing this, this, a certain amount of time of safe operation. Uh, it's, not, it's not a simple task and solving for that is as hard, in my opinion, as solving for level four. So what, what we are going to see at certain points is the deployment of fleets that work in limited environment uh, and uh, with driverless vehicles uh, that can bring you to point A to point B. So hopefully we're gonna see that in, 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 in the in relatively near future, um, but this level four does not compete uh, with level two. Level four, what level four aims to is the replacement of uh, existing services such as Uber, uh, such as public transportation, is just meant to make those services cheaper by removing the driver uh, from, from the loop. So this has been a discussion we've been having before the conference. The, um, I work in the automotive aftermarket and one of the things I do is I watch the car park and watch how it's changing and, and how it's gonna be changing the next 15, 20 years to keep my company um, competitive. So when I thought, um, so ODBC connectors, OBD2 connectors, those are the little, you stick something under your dash, used a lot for some basic diagnostic um, uh, functions. That, that's not smart enough, that's not connected in the right way to make, it, make my dumb car into a level two car. No, yeah, so what we do at Comma and it's taking uh, existing cars, so proving that level two technology can be applied to existing cars. You can take any new cars that have level one capability, and we proved in the video that I showed during the presentation that you can actually turn it into a level two car, uh, because uh, cars that are new and comes out today have already the actuators and a way of communicating, of controlling the actuators, such as gas, brake, and steering, in a way that you can actually uh, have the car driving itself if it, if it is smart enough, if it has the right software and the right compute. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, if you, I, I, the, the way that you interact with the car is uh, tapping into the CAN uh, system of the car, and it can be done through BD2 ports, or it can be done from any other entry level uh, uh, present in the car. Uh, so, so the technology needed to really hit the level two is, is model year 2016 and above, roughly? Well, you need, uh, you, need the act you need the actuators, you need the hardware that comes with the car be ready to be, to be upgraded, basically. Um, so you need pretty much like, yeah, new cars from 2016 and above uh, are, are, a good, are a good target. So, but really, in 2019, almost any new car could be, could be retrofitted with, with level two in theory. Does anybody want to guess what percentage of the car park um, is 2016 and above? Anybody? Who's brave? <laughs> You're pretty close, it's 20%. So that also means um, that, that right now we have a lot of dumb cars on the road that won't be able to 
have the full benefit of you know some uh, aftermarket accessories. There's still some programming you can do through. Um, there's lots of OBD2 port platforms. Um, so for the novice car person who knows just enough Python to get in trouble, um, and GitHub's that can help you get there, but it doesn't take it quite to where it's the driver assist and have the functionality to. Um, yeah, if you want the car to actually be driving itself, you need you need basically access to to the actuators. So um, the age of the vehicles is another thing that, uh, the age of the car park has been something interesting that people in the aftermarket have been watching because people are holding on to cars way longer. In 1996, the average age of a car was 8.5 years. Um, and you had, you had it on the slide earlier, Does it, the, the current age according to IHS of an a average car in America is 11.7 years. And it, it's been predicting to increase. Um, even when there have been uh, movements like the cars, for, uh, cash for cars, that only took uh, 670,000 old cars off the road. So um, yep. there's one challenge I think you're gonna have is getting around those dumb cars. Um, well, so um, definitely th th those cars, those cars like are gonna be around for, for a long time and it's highlighting one important fact uh, that is uh, if the average life of car is about like to be to 12 years and it's actually like increasing over time, mm -hmm. uh, there is really this need of decoupling uh, the hardware of the comes with the car, so the car itself, like the chassis, the actuators, uh, those are meant to last uh, maybe 15 years or more from uh, the part, from the brain of the car that should be something that instead we should be treating as consumer electronics, uh, should be something that we should be able to replace, update. And I'm not talking just about uh, uh, soft uh, over the air updates, so software updates, uh, which uh, none of the car sold today except for Tesla is capable of doing. Um, but I'm also talking about like being able to replace the computing hardware. Uh, in the last 15 years, uh, if you think about cars 15 years ago and you think about cars today, you don't, f I, I, I don't think the perception of the change of those cars has been like so big. Like it still has four wheels, uh, they cost pretty much about the same amount of money and uh, they serve pretty much the same purpose. Uh, what's changed uh, is the cost of computing. In particular, like GPUs, they reduced the cost of computing in the last 15 years uh, by three order of magnitude. So it's 10,000 times cheaper uh, buying GPUs, so having the same compute today that it was 15 years ago. And so if you think about it, well, why, like, think about cars that you buy today and think about them in 15 years from now, how outdated they will feel. Uh, an analogy that I make is like you are buying a house and you are not allowed to replace the washing machine. That's how cars are gonna feel uh, when you buy them now and they are not structured in a decoupled in the proper way. So this is what we're trying to, to solve we, at Comma. We try to make a, retro, a retrofitable kit that, that can work with your existing car and you treat it as a consumer electronic. You treat that device that you install on the windshield, connects with the CAN system of your car with something that after maybe every two years when a new system comes out, uh, you can replace it. There is, there is really no reason why you should replace the whole car to have better driver assistant features. And that's also why we're seeing partnerships. We're seeing large auto automobile manufacturers partner with different technology company to start treating the technology in the car more like a consumer electronic. Um, and that way you can have that upgradability. And as you mentioned before, Tesla is the only one who does over the air updates. So it, it does require some you know, handling and care to get the, the data updated. But change in perspective like that is gonna help. Treating it like uh, the development cycle for electronics I think will help keep you happier when you have your 11.7 year old car in a few years. Yep. Um, let's see. So issues with driverless. Um, you talked this morning about data collection. Um, is there, how, do, how you data collection using your tool? So um, is that a limitation still for three and the, for the higher end cars and commercial? Are there pictures available if, if we're talking the you know, commercial vehicles comes up too. That was very, yep. lots of you know magazine covers with you know fully electric 18 wheelers. How how close are we to there? Well, okay. So um, I think the distinction needs to be made between uh, data collection that is made through uh, like uh, devices and product that are currently sold. So if you work on level two, like for example Tesla, Tesla has the ability of collecting every day four million miles. Like they have enough car that every day they can collect four million miles. Uh, 
Um, at Coma, we, ha we are about uh, 30,000 miles per day that we can collect. Uh, and so if you, if you have a product that you actually sell, it becomes a lot easier to collect the data. And you can actually uh, be a little bit spoiled by the amount of data that you can collect. You can select, uh, you can decide which data to upload. You don't need to upload all the data. Definitely Tesla is not uploading uh, 4 million miles of data every day. Um, so if you work on like level three and above on something that has not been released yet uh, to, to, to the public, then you cannot collect this data from, uh, from, from people, from your device that are out in the field. But it's also important to distinguish between uh, um, which, which type of data you can collect from people just driving a car and which type of data you actually need from the car that you prepared that are driving themselves. Uh, so think about uh, uh, like a, a fleet of self-driving car like level four. Well, like if you are trying to learn uh, to drive from data, you can, you can gather this data from simply like people driving around. They don't need to be driving with your own car. You need to make sure that they have enough sensor and those sensor representative of, of the car that you plan eventually to release for your, for your final system. But you can distinguish between your fleet that you use for testing to test your algorithm that are driving themselves versus uh, the, the fleet that you just use for data collection. So even if you are like working level four, for example, in tracking, uh, you don't need to have like self-driving tracking on the road in order to be able to collect data from tracking. You can like uh, retrofit existing tracking with the right sensors and learn how to drive from manual, from people that are actually driving uh, those, those trucks. So yeah, I think doing that distinction could help uh, like getting into like the segment uh, where it's, it's a little harder to build like big, big networks. And there's, uh, we've seen automation go into agriculture first, since you have, you know, large areas, yep. you know, good opportunity for development, um, you know, some software stuff that still needs to get worked out. <laughs> yes. Uh, right to repair. Um, yeah, agric agriculture is a great example of uh, automation already working very well. Uh, that's relatively easier than self-driving because the safety aspect of it is not, is not like so relevant. Uh, but it's a great example, yeah, how, how automation works. And then, um, We've talked, you know, the last few days about uh, having the right kind of sample set. How different are the videos and how applicable are the models from the different driving styles? So people in New York drive yep. way different than people here. Um, places like Georgia, we have the long commutes yeah. like Houston. So um, what is, is there prioritization? Is it one size fits all with these data? Yeah, no, it's a good question. So um, for, for level two, like for what we do, I mean, the, the more variety we get from data, the better. We try to build a system that somewhat works decently in pretty much like every driving condition. Uh, if you try to build uh, something like a fleet of level four vehicles, I think you should focus on uh, um, your first application. So if your first application is uh, a system that is gonna service people like in a suburban place where like speed is limited, maybe like 230 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour and uh, um, like there is not like huge traffic, then maybe you should like focus on collecting data from those areas because those represent your first like uh, go to market application uh, and you shouldn't try to do some sort of like mixing with uh, uh, data that is coming from environment that are outside the scope of the first release of your product. Uh, so it, it really depends. I, I would say like if you're focusing on level four now, don't try to get data from uh, uh, New York, uh, try, try to focus on where, where you're going to have your first application, and it's now going to be New York. And we had also talked about the applicability of car videos being used for like larger class eight vehicles. You know, camera, it's, it's going to look different even for your modeling. So um, that's a, it's a good thing there's a lot of data out there, and that microprocessors have gotten cheap, cheaper, although um, your cloud storage bill might go up a bit. Um, yeah, that's, uh, the, the, that's the problem. <laughs> Definitely, like, uh, the, the, the sensors uh, have super rich uh, output, uh, like uh, cameras, like you think about the stream of camera, it's like mega, mega, um, megapixels. And so think about how much data that is. Sure, you can compress your video, but it's still like we're talking about, I mean, in our case, uh, um, like the, our device collects uh, pretty much between five and 10 gigabyte of data per hour. If you talk about like level four, you are probably talking about like hundreds of gigabytes per hour collected by, by, by your system. And so, yes, I mean like uh, processing this data becomes like feasible now on uh, like uh, in real time. But then at the same time, if you are storing this data, you have to think about uh, how expensive is going to be your, your storage bill uh, w when you are like uh, uploading all, all these data to your, to your servers. 
Uh, that also opens up, you know, how can, you know, if you're interested in, in working with, you know, autonomous vehicles and, and car tech, um, the, the problem presents a good opportunity for developing new models for, uh, we saw some models for the, the RCNN with picture refinement and different ways to classify images, so um, you're closer to it. So, you know, how are different ways uh, to get in, to, to be involved or the other development opportunities that aren't necessarily in the car type, you know? Yeah, well, so self-driving self cars are mainly like a software problem. It's not really a, a problem that uh, has been some sort of like, I, I see it solved and I see it like, I really frame it as a, as a, software, as a software problem. How do, we, how do we make like a robot uh, that, that can drive uh, as a human or can at least like assist human driving? So uh, yeah, you don't need to be a car expert uh, to be involved. Uh, you need, I mean, hopefully to have like passion for, for software and there are like many aspects of it. Uh, you, can, you can work on, uh, um, machine learning, you can work on planning, controls, uh, data management, infrastructure. There are really, really a lot of aspects uh, uh, about it uh, uh, that people like engineers can, can, get, can get involved with. Um, I mean, if somebody's interested in to, in to getting more involved about it, uh, um, we have, uh, like all our software, it's open source. Like Commodat AI makes all the software open source. It's called uh, OpenPilot. Uh, you can go on GitHub and you can read the application. You can read how our software stack works. And that software is the software that supports uh, the hardware that we sell, which is called the Coma, the Coma Ion. So the hardware that we sell is a smart dash cam. And uh, if, you, if you are interested in being like a developer and learning more about self-driving cars, you can actually put the two things together and you can have uh, um, like a level two retrofit self-driving car, which is the one that I showed in the video. And as you, everybody can imagine, the, the adjacent industries and even the service industries, as, as people's mobility patterns and, and habits change, they've already changed. First with Lyft and now you can get anything delivered to your house. So that opens up um, as we're talking fleets. Fleets have come up a few times. Um, either you know, how could your business be uh, changed by it? Is there some different model that we're seeing? Um, you know, be thinking of this when, as, thinking of autonomous, which I'm sure everybody has been thinking of the, the impact of autonomous vehicles to your business. Um, but fleets and adjacent services are interesting. The utilization rate. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Like one, one good thing about autonomous vehicle, like driverless vehicle, is that the, the, the expected like utilization rate is going to be much higher than any of the car existing. Especially think about like the trucking industry. Um, the trucking industry, when, when we are going to see level four trucks on the road, well, trucking is going to become like radically different because you're not going to be any more constrained by the maximum, I think it's eight hours, like uh, maximum continuous driving from, from drivers. Uh, you can have those trucks like driving pretty much like no stop uh, for, uh, for as, as long as it takes uh, to go from point A to point B. And so, yeah, certain industries uh, and I really look forward to tracking industries are going to be radically changed by, for example, utilization rate. Uh, um, other things that are going to change, uh, I would expect like um, the first application on level four being like there is going to be a company that owns the fleet. Um, like I, I do really see, especially because at the beginning, there is going to be a lot of like iterations, like on the hardware, on the services, on the maintenance. There are a lot of like unknowns. And so I do see it making sense that there is going to be like a company that owns the fleet uh, and uses the fleet uh, as, opposed to, uh, as opposed to what we see today with Uber drivers where it's very distributed. There are like single drivers that own their car and contribute to the fleet. Instead, I rather see uh, those fleet being directly managed and centralized uh, by the company that provides the, the service. And, and if, if upgrading is a bigger deal with the, uh, you know, the smarter cars, uh, getting software updates and that have to happen, fleet management makes more sense in that, or can make a lot of sense in that context. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, as, as I was mentioning, like the, there is this need of uh, being like closely connected with your fleet, being able to upgrade your cars, uh, and especially like at the beginning. So definitely. It's going to be like the first implementation. Uh, it's going to be like our own fleet. Awesome. Um, oh, does anybody know the utilization rate for a consumer car? Unless you're like an Uber driver, because that's or you know in your car, the average it, you end up not using your car. It's parked around 90% of the time, whereas you can kind of flip that model with an autonomous vehicle. Um, it, it's 
in delivery services, you can have like last mile issues. You actually might need to have a human doing some interaction, but again, you know, looking for ways you can interact with this new industry, that's, that is something. If there's not a driver in the car, how would your business work with them and serve them? So would that change any, any aspect of what you're doing now? Um, let's see. Um, how about consumer adoption of, um, of AVs? Yeah. So. Well, so, okay, if we talk about level two, uh, it's really something that it's, it's hard to convey. So j just, to have, just to have an idea, like how many of you have been in a level two uh, self-driving car? Like, raise your hand if you have been. Like, I would say it's like 10%. Yeah. 10% of you have been like in a level two. Well, consider that there are 0.2% of uh, cars are level two on, on, on the road today. So 10%, yeah, you, you, this audience definitely got a good exposure to them. Huh? Uh, and it's something that you need to experience and you need to realize how better your driving can be uh, and how safer it can be um, because uh, you are basically relieved by the stress of constantly having to interact with your car, making sure that you're keeping the proper distance uh, with the car ahead of you. Uh, also, a car that drives itself has a much shorter reaction time because like, you have a computer like watching the road and taking actions. And then at the same time, you have a monitoring system that constantly reminds you that you have to pay attention. And I mean, it's debated. Uh, there are certain, I mean, th there are voices that say, this is actually gonna be harder to manage from the driver because it's gonna push people to get more distracted. I've been driving these systems, I've been developing this system, and uh, everybody that I've told to that has been like on a level two systems uh, has, has a pretty good opinion about how level two can actually like improve uh, people's, people's driving. So I think it's something like the demand will grow as the offer will grow, as more and more cars will push towards level, will be, will be equipped with level two systems, I think the acceptance rate is gonna grow as a consequence. Um, I would say for level four, um, I, I think it's gonna be literally like a question of costs. Uh, as I said before, level four already exists and you can, you can be driven from point A to point B without having to drive. It's just a matter of uh, can I offer something that is like practical, can bring it to, from point A to point B with eventually the same amount or less time and uh, the same cost or less. Uh, if that's true, then acceptance rate for like level four uh, is going to be is going to be met. Uh, it's going to is going to happen. Otherwise, uh, they, they are not going to succeed. And it's not obvious that it's going to be the case. Definitely, I don't see it being the case for for quite a bit. So the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration has been a proponent of some of these these driver assist because they save lives. Like the safer you can make cars. Um, I think that helps me work through acceptance of like letting my you know Siri yell at me about staying in my lane. Um, just because the balance of, you know, inattention does, you know, accidents happen when, when people are not paying attention. So I think that's gonna help be at least a driver for it. And it's, it's definitely messaging we've seen needs that do. Um, no, definitely, like, the, the safety aspect is very important. Uh, I think there is a huge opportunity for level two to make a car safer. Uh, the starting point is not great. Uh, like, uh, fatal accidents are the number one cause of death among young people between age 16 and 24 and uh, they represent about like 2% because of death uh, uh, worldwide. Um, so there's definitely like a big opportunity there to make a car safer and smarter. Um, regarding level four, there is a little bit like, a, not, uh, I see a lot of like unfair comparison uh, when we talk about safety related to level four because uh, what, what one of the thing that is being said when, when you, people like talk about level four is, oh well, it's gonna be a lot safer. But again, you don't have to compare level four with uh, like you driving the car. You have to compare level four with the services that level four compete with, uh, which is uh, public transportation, which is uh, Uber driver, which if you take a Uber, I would say it's probably like an order of magnitude safer than you driving your car, if anything, because he's offering your service and he's paying more attention than if you weren't in the car. So w w when you talk about safety for level four, you need to contextualize it and compare Apple to Apple, which I don't see done like v very often. While in level two, well, you need to be better than uh, uh, people driving their car. Um, do you wanna take some questions? I, Definitely. Y'all had yes. questions after us earlier. Yes, so. great, a lot of questions. I think, uh, yeah, there was before. See any potential for complacency on if you're at level two for too long before technology hits level four, 
is the average driver out there that's tweeting, looking at Facebook on their computers, uh, become complacent and get distracted. You see accident rates going higher than you anticipate. As currently level two drivers, they know they're in a Tesla, they know they're supposed to be enacting, so they're participating more. If the lag between level two and level four is years, do you see that people will trust it too much in the increase in accident rates? No, I think it's actually going around, uh, the other way around. Uh, I think like people that get into level two cars today are more confused about the technology, probably are not completely aware of the technology. One thing that I, I wish Tesla was doing that it doesn't, and actually we do, is driver monitoring. So how do we actually be monitor that the driver is paying attention? That's a good way to like educate on the spot about what's the proper behavior to take when you're on a level two car. You have to pay attention. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you have like a camera watching the driver, GM does that on super, with Super Cruise. Uh, yeah. There is like a video camera, an infrared camera that looks at you and uh, can tell you if you're distracted. And we do the same thing. And I think this is very important. So as we move forward, I think there will be, as the acceptance and the understanding of what leverage system is, I think uh, like drivers and users will be better educated uh, because they'll understand what the technology is. Um, so, no, I don't, I, I expect that over time things are actually going to get better, things are, people are going to be better educated than they currently are. And not to be punitive, but I think the other thing that naturally comes from that is it, as the drivers are monitors, you know, that will be introduced as evidence in a court case at some point. So, I think knowing that you have a camera on you also will affect, you know, your interaction with it, not just, you know, fall asleep on the 405, hopefully. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it really depends. Like, I mean, currently we don't, we don't collect people's, people's face unless they consent to and they help us, like, training driver monitoring models. So somebody needs to actively uh, consent to, give, to, to be able for us to record their data. Otherwise, we just provide uh, the feature, but we don't record the data. Uh, but yes, definitely, like, okay. it could be a good opportunity. Okay. Question up front here. Um, yes, who so is, yeah. Okay, so I hope okay. I can ask this question properly, but, if I'm Ford, and what, how will I be adopting all of this? So what will it look like? So you're saying today Tesla is the only company that has the software update. Will all cars have that? What will Ford be doing over the next 10 years? What will their production look like to be able to start adopting this? What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I can say it because I, I'm in the that industry, so and I've seen Toyota has been doing partnerships with Uber on both autonomous EVs and retrofitting like Sienna's, so like uh, to regular internal combustion engine cars. And what what I'm seeing evidence of is they're hedging their bets. It might move this way. It might go way more electric. You know, is the supply chain to support you know a more electric car part in place? But they, they have for years, although they might not be on the road, they are doing R&D and, in, I'm not just saying for Ford, I'm saying in general for the, the car manufacturers, we're seeing them partner. They're, they've started forming alliances. You can start seeing different clusters of ones that are working with others. So um, I don't think they have the, the full answer yet, but at least no, we, okay. for level four, for the different levels of development, um, they have been investing money in that. So, yeah, the way that I see it, like, I, I don't know what they are waiting for, definitely, because, uh, I mean, if you think about that, like, for a software recall, they have, like, let's say you have a software glitch, and that happened, it happened, like, in Toyotas, like, several times, like, on Prius, right? So you have, you have a software recall, and to do a software recall, you have to recall millions of cars. How much of a cost is that? Like, quantifies that, uh, it's like hundreds of millions if you have to recall, like, millions of cars. Uh, uh, that's the equivalent of money that you have to spend for a software update. And then also like the development cycle, your development cycle is much longer, right? So you, I mean, when you release, like the fact that you can do so over, over the air update doesn't mean that what you release isn't safe, right? So you need to work out the safety part of your software before you release it and that part doesn't change. But then I would say there is like an extra probably 70% that is just like user interface, things that are not safety critical that if there is a glitch, it's not the end of the world, then you can work out those uh, making updates over the air. So how much shorter will the development cycle be if you don't need like to test for so many hours uh, the fact that if you click a button, the, the, the proper answer on UI happens, right, for, for example. So I really don't understand what, what they're waiting for, but the actual answer is uh, 
Um, I mean, like those companies uh, are very good at making cars, very, making reliable cars. They have a little bit to reinvent themselves if they want to be up to date with, uh, with, 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 with software, because it's a software problem. It's an infrastructure problem that you have to build uh, and it's something new. So, but they have to do it. If they want to be relevant, uh, uh, if they want to survive, they, they, they have to get into this. Otherwise, like, there is no way to compete with other companies that actually are making this a possibility. There is like a, there's a huge cost opportunity there. Uh, and yeah, they have to jump into it. And that's why I like partnerships, because there, there's a lot of value in people doing what they excel at companies too. So if, if you're awesome at making cars, you know, partner with people who are awesome at the technology problem. All right, Carl? Yeah, just I want to return back to this, uh, the concept of safety as you move through the, the different levels here. You talked extensively about that. What are some of the, the AI approaches uh, that are being developed to address uh, adversarial type of threats to smart vehicles? For example, uh, you, you know, you can have like obstruction of signage, for example, and trick a vehicle <laughs> thinking that, oh, that's not a stop sign. So I'm gonna go right by it. So what are some of the solutions in the AI space uh, that is being explored to make sure that as you move through those levels yes. of autonomy, that these vehicles are getting smarter and not uh, so susceptible to tricks and adversarial attacks? Definitely, so I mean like the, the problem gets a lot easier the more miles you can collect because you have the choice of deciding which, which data to favor. So for example, like as I showed during the presentation, um, the large majority of data that you collect from, from cars, so if you don't distinguish the one that is good and the one that is, the one that is useful and the one that is not, it's like boring data. It's like you driving on the highway, there's not much to learn after a certain point. And so yes, you need to favor those events that are somewhat events from which you can learn. So like having a over distribution of your data that, that are represented by, by specific events from which you can learn. And you can do that in many ways. Like one way that you can do it is like uh, mark every intervention that the try like if, if you have your your system that is like a level two system every time that the user intervenes to correct the car it's somewhat like a disengagement it's somewhat like something that the car didn't do right and so you can actually collect those events and favor those events uh, to learn something specific uh, that well, so reinforcement learning is a little bit, yes, reinforcement learning, well, that's somewhat different, like reinforcement learning in the sense that you, you deploy something and you use like the user as, as some sort of like uh, your, your feedback, uh, there is some, some sort of like uh, ethical aspect to it uh, that should be considered because you're using like the user as your like reinforcement loop. But in a certain sense, it's, it's, it's fair to do it as long as like what you release at any given time is safe. Now more interesting, like you can do reinforcement learning like completely like offline. So you can, you can train your model applying reinforcement learning. So you, tap, you set up like a simulator like we do in at Comma and, uh, and you make the car learning from, from a reinforcement learning uh, uh, system. So you generate the data. So you, you generate situation where you put the car in, in a situation where it shouldn't be and you learn from that. Uh, it's, it's, it's tricky, it's not, it's not a simple thing, but uh, we, we have like good approaches at Kama that we, that we are investigating and we're actually like using right now on, on models that we are deploying. Uh, yes? Amber? So I know you've been asked this probably a hundred times before and this question is not new at all, but I'm interested on your take on it. So the safety issue, if you have a car and there are pedestrians and the car has to decide if it's going to crash to save the pedestrians or the people in the car, or maybe a way to crash to save the people in the car in the front versus the back, yep. how would a car make that decision? Great, so you, you're right. I've been asked a hundred of times about this. <laughs> uh, and the answer is, uh, I, I, I don't think it's like, very, very relevant problem at the moment. Like the, the technology is behind and it's not at the point where like this kind of decision matters. And also I don't think it's very relevant, even if we were at that point, I don't think the answer is very relevant. At the point that you made um, like a car that is like driving safer than a human, like those sort of decisions uh, are really down the point where they, they don't matter. I don't see such like, I don't see it even from an ethical point of view, I don't see it being like particularly relevant. Like let the engineer decide, like as long as the overall output, the overall system is like safer, it, it, it does not really matter. Like what, what would a human do? Like the only reason why we don't pass this question to human is because we think that it's happening fast enough that the human doesn't have to think about it. But so what would a human do? Let's say you have enough time to think about it. And in some case you might have enough time to think about this situation. What would a human do? 
Um, and I would say an, an, another possible answer is, well, how to prevent this sort of situation before it's like you want, you want to be able to minimize as much as possible a situation where you have no good options. Um, so mm -hmm. that would be step one. And then step two is like, I mean, like what a human do? I, 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 don't, I don't think it's an ethical question that applies to robots. I think it's an ethical question that like could, ap could apply to human if you really want to ask the question, I think. And I know during Startup Week, Drive AI did a presentation and that question came up there. And for their models, they train to stop. So like even if it doesn't have to be an immediate safety thing, and this is, it, I, it was in limited deployment, but it was to take the car safely to a stop before they got to where it was collision close, but. Um, yes. Yeah, and Donald. Do you see brighter, less technology being applied to other forms of transportation, such as ships, boats, trains, planes, or even motorcycles? Uh, yes, well, okay, in planes it's already, it's already happened. Uh, um, it's, not, it's not full automation, but like, it's, I would say like planes are the closest thing to what we intend as level two, level two driver, uh, driver like the social driving cars. Uh, in agriculture, already happened, like you have these like big, big tractors uh, doing, doing the field work uh, without human assistance. Uh, ships, I'm not an expert in ships, but I would say that yeah, most of the ship work can be done without a like, human constantly like interacting with it, and there are probably like good warning systems uh, to avoid uh, colliding with icebergs. <laughs> 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 Um, and uh, uh, other fields like train, I'm train are already like pretty pretty well automated. Like met met metros, there are like metros, like newer metros don't even have uh, like a, a drive, like a machinist, like a person that stays uh, stays in uh, in um, in like physically uh, looking into it, being into the into the metro itself. Uh, and uh, into the pods and like driving, driving the metro around. So um, yeah, I mean, it's already happened. I think uh, it's gonna happen and it already happened sooner in other fields uh, before it's gonna happen in uh, uh, self-driving cars. So self-driving cars are probably gonna be like the tail of, uh, of these things, which is why when we talk about like level five, this idea of having like a car that drives complete itself without uh, the assistance of a human as well as a human would, uh, it's not something that is going to happen uh, uh, without us noticing it. Uh, it's going to be, I think, uh, at the tail of many other fields uh, that are going to be automated first. Uh, so we, we, we're going to know. When, when we're going to be close to level five, uh, we will know it. Uh, if, we, if now we don't know it, it means that we are not close. I think one good thing that comes out of it, though, is a lot of the technology used to detect things and solve problems in level two and up cars can be used for assisted technology on other modes of transportation. So they've already had kind of independent aids that can help you know people navigate who are mobility challenged. So I think that is one just nice, nice natural consequence of the development that's happening in your space. Okay, Anna. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question, which is a twist on the question about the pedestrian and the passenger. So obviously, you as a company and all companies will have tremendous, uh, tremendous incentive to make it an accident-free environment because one accident is going to drive your share price down. So that will necessarily limit what your car will allow the, the passenger to want to do. So if I want to speed in my own car and I'm driving, I have the full autonomy to do whatever I want and I'm taking my full risk. When the decision is, is delegated to the car manufacturer, they have the, uh, the incentive to minimize um, accidents at the expense of individual passenger or owner autonomy. Can you yeah. express your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I think like uh, people shouldn't speed and uh, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, I don't see why cars like can be are able to go up to 100 miles per hour. Like if the max limit is like 70, like let's say 70, let's say 80 miles per hour. Like limit the speed at 80 miles per hour. Like the large majority of accidents are caused because people are driving in a way they're not supposed to drive. So limiting uh, the the way that the car is capable, what the car is capable of doing, is not a limit to freedom of like owner of the car to to drive the car. It's actually like a smart thing to do. Uh, but I want to also like uh, comment on the first thing that you said, which is like one accident for autonomous vehicle is going to be very bad, and it's going to there is a need to push for accident freeze. Well, I mean, perfect is the worst enemy of good, right? So, 
let, let, let's focus on where we are now and let's try to make things better. Let's not overemphasize of accidents. Yes, there's gonna be accidents, but we have a lot of accidents now. We need to make something that is better than now. If we, if we, if we emphasize too much, like for example, we do with planes, when there is a, like a plane accident, we emphasize it too much, then people are gonna have this like over perception of what safety is. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to avoid, we need to do our best to avoid uh, to get into this like forced perception that uh, self-driving cars are not gonna be safe because we have heard a lot about one accident. Uh, we have to weight it with actual data, actual numbers. Uh, we have to weight it with the 37,000 uh, uh, fatalities that happen each year in US. And so, yeah, I think, I think we need to have a database approach uh, when, when we talk about safety and it's really important that we push for that. Yes. So you're talking about uh, an autonomous vehicle. Uh, is there any development uh, uh, that a vehicle is part of a network and they will exchange information, like intent? What a car, like intent, what a car is going to do? It's going to turn oh, right, so, and so that other cars know. So you're talking like vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Exactly. Now? Uh, or, to, I, or to traffic lights or whatever. Yes, okay, so I, the, 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 I think it's different things. I think one of them is good, one of them is not going to happen. So what is not going to happen, I think, is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. The problem with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication are probably, I would say, two. One problem is uh, it's gonna be very hard to make uh, every car manufacturer to agree on a protocol of communication. Uh, I just don't see this, this happening. Like, so we, which type of data are gonna exchange? Because like, you basically need to have many developers agreeing on, on, on a common standard. Um, and also, I don't see it being necessary. Like, you, you understand what the other car is doing by observing the other car. Uh, you don't need to know in advance what the other car is going to do. And also, like, how do you trust? Uh, like, you are not the developer. Like, if, if, if you're talking about vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication between your cars, probably you can do something, but you're not gonna have a fleet that is large enough uh, to be relevant and to be something that you can rely on. Um, so if you have to rely on somebody else's development of like uh, attributes like intentions, path accelerations, uh, those things that are not even simple to, to measure and to predict in the future, well, imagine trusting not something that you develop, but trusting something that somebody else developed. Um, so I don't think, uh, even if it was the case, I don't think this being being useful. Like I don't see, I don't see this being useful. One thing that instead I do see happening is vehicle to infrastructure communication, B2I or B2X. So B2X in general, like this idea that like the car needs some information from the infrastructure. So for example, like traffic lights, you want to optimize for traffic, you want to optimize for like going from A to B, you want to know the state of, for example, of uh, um, um, traffic lights. And so yeah, you can know that, but that's different because there is like a manufacturer or that makes the standard and then it's up to the car developers agreeing to a standard that they didn't have to agree to, they, they just had to, to comply with. Um, so that's, that's a little bit easier uh, to push uh, as a standard. And also I see it being useful. Um, I see like, uh, yeah, I mean, knowing in advance uh, information uh, that, that's definitely useful. And uh, I mean, in a certain sense, it's already happening like B2X, like if you wanna know, like, I mean, like your GPS position, like in, in a certain sense, it's B2X, right? You are, you are, you are communicating with, uh, with satellites. So it's just an evolution of what's already here. Yes? So uh, standards for um, inter-communication uh, already exist in the development world. Why do you think it would be different for autonomous vehicles? Like, well, why do you think developers wouldn't create, come together and create a set of standards that they can uh, develop on? Well, because, I mean, fundamentally, there is really no, so that, 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 I mean, that's like a reason, for, I mean, I'm saying, uh, yes, you can build standards, part of a communication, but if there is no a real need for that, like a real advantage, that's another reason for that not to happen. So it's two obstacles, not only one. So agreeing on something is an obstacle. Be, it not being useful is another obstacle. So if you put these two things together, that's why I see it's not going to happen for, for vehicles. I'm not saying it's impossible to agree on, on standards. I'm saying that if there is not a, like a big push for it, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I think if you like, you, 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 you peep, I mean, the companies should invest on like understanding the environment, understanding what other cars are doing, predicting what other uh, like players on the environment are doing based on what you observe from them, rather than having them telling you. Also, like 
it's going to happen, it's, it might work okay for cars, but what about cyclists, what about pedestrians? Uh, and those are like equivalently hard uh, players on, on, this, on, this, on, on, the, like on the environment that you have to deal with. And so, yeah, even if, you, if it could help, it's not something that you can rely entirely because not, this information cannot even come from uh, all, all the players in the environment. Time for just a couple more questions. You got yes. a mic? Yep. How much, what kind of security measures uh, you, you guys have been taking not to hack your software? Yeah. So, I mean, like, okay. So, you know, when, when you develop systems uh, for, uh, for like level two, it's different than when you, help, when you develop like safety systems from level three and above. When you develop systems for like level two, the, 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 the driver is always responsible in the end. And uh, so you need to make sure that every action that the car takes in autonomy is never gonna be too abrupt to make uh, the driver not capable of retaking control of the vehicle if the, if the car does something wrong. So by doing this, you are limiting, for, for example, the amount of, uh, uh, like the, the, the operational domain of your actuators. Uh, some example, like uh, um, the, the braking system, you need to make sure that your braking system is never gonna command uh, too much braking deceleration because uh, if you are mistakenly braking uh, when you shouldn't and you are driving on highway at high speed, then you can cause an accident. So the way that you make those systems safe for level two is you, you limit your operational domain. What that translates into is uh, you are making a system that by design is not going to be able to handle 100% of the miles that you drive. To, to give you like some numbers, like um, people that drive with the Tesla autopilot, uh, from some statistics, uh, so some people from the University of MIT uh, collected uh, uh, a large data from, from a fleet that they monitored, and 30, I think it's 32% of the miles driven are driven with uh, autopilot on. For us, for people that drive with open pilot, it's 52%. Uh, we are working towards uh, the 80%. Uh, maybe 85, we know we are not, like by design of a level two system is not gonna get to 100%. There are certain environment where if you have the car operating in autonomy there, it's just not going to be safe because in order to be able to drive in this environment, the car is taking actions that you might not be able to uh, retake control quick enough. For example, taking like 90 degree turns in an environment where there are a lot of pedestrian arounds. Like this is not a place where level two system are going, are, are going to work or operate. If you want to work in this environment, you need a level four and above. Oh, we're running out of time and yes. you'll be here to answer questions in the yeah, hallway. Yeah, I'm gonna be around. Awesome. Yes. Any parting thoughts before? No, I think, I mean, like I would say, like I, I recommend, like if you want to get involved with a little bit more with Kama, uh, go on kama.ai, our website, or go on our GitHub, explore our code, see what we do, and see what is like our approach of trying to make uh, the existing uh, fleet of cars uh, uh, smarter than what they are now. All right. well, this was entertaining. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you.